Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this very special edition of the Saif, um, sorry, for the Saif uh, Gubash Panipal <laughs> Prize for Arabic Literature Translation. Um, it gave us a great pleasure in Arts Canteen to be partnering with the fantastic uh, Panipal, who has put a massive effort on this initiative tonight. Um, I will really would like also to remind all of our guests tonight of the dreadful and uh, shocking news in both Turkey and Syria and Lebanon. And we uh, stand here in solidarity and sympathy with all the victims in those countries. Um, I would really also, um, I know this is not maybe um, a favor, but if there is any chance that uh, maybe participants can can donate whatever they can uh, for this disaster, that would be very much uh, helpful to those families and children and victims. Uh, on this occasion also, I would like to thank uh, my colleague Aaron, uh, who is on the digital producer tonight, and also uh, my colleague Fishin, she was uh, working in the vaccine uh, to promote and to plug uh, this event this evening. Obviously, uh, Arts Canteen is proud to be a partner on the third uh, uh, year with, with Panipal. And uh, I will leave you now with the chair, uh, Mr. Paul, who will be kindly able to introduce all the panelists and the speakers. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Asir. Uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, welcome to this evening celebrations of the winners of the 2022 Saif Gulbash Banipal Prize for Arabic Literary Translation. Rather unusually this year, there are two joint winners. Firstly, the late Humphrey Davis for his translation of The Men Who Swallowed the Sun by Hamdi Abu Ghulayil. And secondly, Robin Moja for his translation of Slipping by Muhammad Khair. I am Paul Starkey, the chair of the Banipal Trust for Arab Literature, which has been supporting the prize since 2005 in conjunction with the Society of Authors, to whom we are most grateful for their administrative abilities. The prize, of course, could not continue without the continued support of the Gobash family, to whose generosity we remain indebted. Some of you may have been present at the Society of Authors event last night, at which the prizes for translations from a number of languages were presented, including ours, the Arabic ones. Tonight, however, is our own celebration, if I can put it that way, and it will in many ways be a unique one as one of the joint winners, Humphrey Davis, was well known to many of us, both professionally and personally, uh, is sadly no longer with us. The celebration then will divide itself into three parts. Firstly, a tribute to Humphrey Davis and his work as a translator, delivered by Catherine Halls, who was one of the judges for this year's competition and also knew Humphrey well. Secondly, readings in Arabic and English by the authors and translators of extracts from the two winning works, Hamdi Abu Ghulayil uh, and uh, uh, Hamdi Abu Ghulayil uh, and Muhammad Khair, and the, ex and the translations will be read by Robin Moja in the case of uh, Muhammad Khair's book. Uh, Humphrey Davis's extracts will be read by his brother, Hugh Davis, uh, and we're very uh, pleased and proud to have him with us tonight. Then finally, a uh, final section of the evening will be a discussion between myself, Robin, and Karis Olshok, who was chair of judges on this year's panel of judges. Uh, there will also be an opportunity at this point for members of the audience to put questions to Robin uh, and Karis, which you will be able to do using uh, the chat facility on Zoom which you should be able to find uh, at the bottom of your screen. 
So without further ado, therefore I'd like to introduce Catherine Halls uh, and her tribute to Humphrey Davis. Catherine. Hi everyone. I'm really thrilled to have been asked to give a brief tribute to Humphrey Davis at tonight's celebration. <clears throat> It goes without saying, I think, that Humphrey will be widely remembered as a distinguished translator and scholar of Arabic literature, but he was also a supportive colleague, an affectionate friend, and a charming character whose quirky sense of humour I loved. Humphrey's long career began with a degree in Arabic at Cambridge, which he completed in 1968, followed immediately by a year on the Centre for Arabic Studies Abroad programme at the American University in Cairo, where he learnt Arabic, where he furthered his Arabic. After working in publishing in the Middle East and helping compile the monumental Heinz Badawi Dictionary of Egyptian Arabic, he embarked on a PhD at UC Berkeley, where he worked on editing and translating a 17th century Egyptian dialect text. He graduated in 1981, and over the next 15 years, he worked in the NGO sector in various countries across the Arab world. It was only in 2002 that he published a translation of Sayyid Ragab's short story, Rat, which appeared, of course, in Banapal magazine. This was the beginning of Humphrey's career in, career in literary translation, which saw him translate 28 books by my count, ranging from smash hits like the Yakubian Building to no novels by noble winner Nagib Mahfouz and historical works like Ahmed Ferris Shadiak's four volume Leg Over Leg. Over the years, Humphrey also maintained his interest and expertise in Egyptian colloquial Arabic. One of his most significant achievements was the publication that came out of his doctoral work, Yusuf al-Shirbini's Brains Confounded by the Ode of Abu Shaduf Expounded. And together with Madi Hadas, he also compiled an anthology of the written dialect covering over 600 years. Humphrey lived in Cairo for decades and his love of the city found its way into a field guide to the street names of central Cairo, which he wrote with Leslie Lebabidi. It was always wonderful to hear his reminiscences, some of them unimaginable now. I recall a young taxi driver looking, looking amazed when Humphrey said he remembered the days when you still had to drive through fields to get to Maidi, a southern suburb of Cairo now swallowed by the city. He even saw Umm Kalthum sing at the old opera house, which was later destroyed in a fire and replaced with a car park. Humphrey was awarded the inaugural Banapal Prize in 2006, the Gate of the Sun by Elias Khoury, which also won the English Pen Writers in Translation Award. And in 2010, he won the Banapal Prize again for Yalo by the same author. As one of the judges of the 2022 prize, I was delighted that we were able to award Humphrey a posthumous hat trick for his truly outstanding translation of The Men Who Swallowed the Sun by Hamdi Abu Ghulayr. Although sad he isn't here to celebrate with us or to answer some of the questions I have about his translation choices, which I know he would have loved to discuss with us. I should add that with two books still to appear, Stella Maris by Elias Khoury and Tawq al-Hamama, a classical Arabic text, I believe it's technically possible that he might still take the prize for a fourth time. Although he was many years my senior in age and experience, I was lucky to be able to call, call Amor Humphrey a colleague and a friend. His collegiality took the form not of mentorship and advice, but of joyful collaboration and critique that always centered on the text itself. Several years ago, he proposed to Adam Talib and me that we meet to share works in progress, and so we exuberantly picked through each other's translations on a regular basis until he became ill, each of us glad to be in the company of others as exacting and pedantic as ourselves. His invitation reflected the generous but natural way he had of treating younger translators as peers and equals, and the sheer pleasure he took in reading, translating, and playing with words. As one might expect, Humphrey's emails always brought a smile to my face. The last New Year's greeting he sent me read, I hope you get smashed and forget everything about last year except the good bits, which I think captures his irreverent spirit perfectly. In 2010, after winning the Banapal Prize for the second time, Humphrey had this to say. Contact with the author is extremely important to date, I've been fortunate enough to be able to consult almost all the living authors whose works I've translated. I have questions for the dead too, when I meet them. I greatly miss Humphrey's company, company, criticism and collaboration, a sentiment I know must be shared by many people here today. But it's a comfort to imagine that if there is an afterlife, Humphrey is there somewhere quizzing Yusuf Shirbini on exactly what he meant on page such and such of his manuscript. I'm sure they're keeping each other entertained. Thanks. 
Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, and so we move on to the next section of this evening's proceedings, uh, which is the readings from the two works concerned. Uh, so I'm going now to invite Hamdi Abu Gulayil to read an extract uh, from The Men Who Swallowed the Sun in its original Arabic version. And this will be followed straight on by the English translation of the same passage, uh, which will be read by Humphrey's brother, Hugh Davis. Thank you, Hamdi. Uh, بكم على هذه الصحبة الجميلة وهذه الجائزة العظيمة أنا سعيد بها أنا كنت أتمنى أن أتكلم عن هامفري مع راشد فصل لكن لأن هامفري عمد معجزة في هذه الرواية وأنا سعيد أنه هو جهده وجد من يقدره في وقت من النادر أن يجد الجهد العظيم من يقدره الرواية دي مغامرتي اللغوية الأجرأ مش مفهومة لدى الكثير من القراء المصريين والعرب لأنها كوكتيل من اللهجات وأنا دايما بقول أن ساعدت كمان أنها تتقري في ترجمة هامفري في ظروف آمنة ظروف لغوية آمنة لأن أكيد الإنجليزي ما فيش التباينات بين اللهجة البدوية والفيومية والقاهرية والليبية والمغربية ولهجة الشباب الشباب مش لاهي لفظة مش عايز أقول اللي سافروا إيطاليا ده الهاربين إلى إيطاليا فأنا جاءت مفروض أقرأ فشكرا لهنفري وشكرا لكم الصوت تمام أمم أيوة مية مية صوت تمام أنت سمعني سمعين سمعين طيب الزعيم صالح بحبون الليبي هو نفس صالح بحبون المشرق المصري ولما سافر ليبيا عرف عليه باعتباره من قبيلة أمه التي ينتسب لها الزعيم ورغم أنه لا يحب زوج أمه ويكره الزعيم وقبيلته شخصيا إلا أنه تجنس بها قيل له على الأقل تكيل باعيش وهي, وهي توكل الحقيقة فكون الواحد من قبيلة الزعيم في بلد يحكمها الزعيم حاجة تفتح كل الأبواب وتزلل كل الصعاب وصالح عربي مشرقي فقير كان يعيش مع أمه في عزبة عطية أقصى جنوب الفيوم وكان يخدم مع والده في بيت العمدة ولما مات العمدة وضاعت العمدية وتقسم الميراث وجاء من نصيب ابن لا يجد أساسا من ما يأكله سافر ليبيا في السبعينات كان صبيا في السابعة عشر من عمره وسافر هذه حاجات أنا مش مزول عنها مش شباب في التليفون الزاي أنا آسف أستاذ حمدي سمعنا أنا آسف مش عارف أعمل إيه والله للتليفون تفضل يا أستاذ حمدي بس بس يا ريت تحاول تعيد تشغيل الميكروفون مرة ثانية لو سمحت أنا آسف يا أنا أنا بداية أنا راجل بداية ماليش في الحاجات دي <تصفيق> أنا وصلنا إيه على إيه وصالة عربي مشرقي فقير أنتوا سامعيني كده؟ سامعين يا أستاذ حمدي، سامعين تماما، تفضل أنا آسف طيب وصالة عربي مشرقي فقير كان يعيش مع أمه في عزبة عطية أقصى جنوب الفيوم وكان يخدم مع والده في بيت العمدة 
ولما مات العمدة وضاعت العمدية وتأسهم الدراس وجاء في نصيب ابن لا يجد أساسا ما يأكله سفر ليبيا في السبعينات كان صبيا في السبعة عشر من عمره وصف وسفر سلكاو مع حمير التهريب ونزل على السلوم وصار وسط حمير البضائع المهربة سبعة عشر كيلو في الصحراء وعد السلك ووصل المساعد وسط مجموعة من جيرانه واثنين من أقاربه وعلى طول عرفوا عليه كعائد ليبي صاد شيم من قبيلة الزعيم واشتغل في شركة للبناء مع الشوباش العرب الشهير بوجابور والمطرب الأشهر عوضبو عبد القادر المالكي وكان مثله صبية في السابعة عشر من عمره عمرهم وفيهم جاءت خمس مصفحات من الجيش الليبي وأخذتهم مع المطرب وأبو جرجور وكل الصادقين العاملين في الشركة وكانوا أربعين بين مؤهل وغير مؤهل ولبسوهم في الجيش ومركز تدريب من نار لمدة ثلاث شهور ثم تخرجوا في حفل عسكري حضره القائد الزعيم بنفسه وأخذوا أسماء الشباب اللي من قبيلته ووزعوهم على حرسه الشخصي في العزيزية آخر معقله أو معسكره الدائم وهو نفس المعسكر الذي صرخ فيه صرخته الأخيرة قبل أن يقتل والباقي وزعوهم على صرايا الصادشين المحاربة المحاربة في صحراء أوزو والزعيم كان يفضل الجنود الصادشين ويثق فيهم ويعاير الجنود الليبيين بصبرهم وإتقانهم وإخلاصهم وتفانيهم في العمل العسكري وأثناء الترحيل في الصحراء المحتدة بين سرك حيث معسكر التدريب وسابها حيث جهة القتال في أوزو هرب المضرب عوض بو عبد القادر المالكي هرب وعاد إلى مصر وبدأ مجده الفني وانضم صالح إلى حرس الزعيم في العزيزية كان حا... حا... كان حرس عادي لابس البدلة العسكرية والبوريه ومأفر وقف بالسلاح على الباب الرئيسي كان فيه من الصادشين رتب وعقداء وقادة كبار كالعقيد الريفي الذي كان أصلا رمحي من الفيوم وهو الذي حرر أوزو وصالح لأنه غير متعلم كان عسكري عادي لكن معه سلطة إطلاق النار على أي حد يدخل العزيزية دون إذن الزعيم حتى لو كان نائب نفسه وبهذه السلطة شارك صالح بعبونا حرس العزيزية الذين فتحوا النار على الضب حسن إشكال برضو قتيلا إشكال كان من الضباط المقربين من الزعيم وكان من قبيلته وكان أصلا ضابطا مدنيا في شقة السبع وعندما قام صورة الفاتح العظيم نقله الزعيم للجيش وعينه قائدا للقوات المرابطة حول مسقط رأسه سرع ولا أحد يعرف سبب مقتله أو مقتله على باب العزيزية شكرا لكم The leader, Saleh Bubu Habuna, the Libyan, is the same person as Saleh Bubu Habuna, the Egyptian, from the Mashrigi tribe. When he went to Libya, they identified him as belonging to his mother's husband's tribe, to which the leader also belonged. And even though he didn't like his mother's husband, and had a particular hatred for the leader and his tribe, he joined it. He told them, at least you can live off them. Truly said, for to belong to the leader's tribe in the country the leader ruled was to find that all doors open before one and all difficulties melted away. Saleh was a poor Mashrigi Bedouin who'd been living with his mother in the village of Outer Atiyah, in the south of the Fayyum. 
he had worked as a servant with his father in the headman's house. And when the headman died and the headmanship was lost to the family, the inheritance was divided up. He ended up as part of the son's share and couldn't even afford to feed himself. So he went to Libya in the 70s. He was 17 and went under wire with the smugglers' donkeys. First Saloum, then the march 17 kilometers into the desert, hidden among the donkeys carrying the smuggled goods. And he crossed the wire and arrived at Masayit along with a group of his neighbors and two of his relations. Immediately, they gave him papers as a Libyan Saad Sheen returnee from the leader's tribe, and he worked in a construction company with the now celebrated Bedouin praise caller and master of wedding ceremonies, Bougagur, and the even more celebrated singer, Awad Bouabdel Gadar al Meliki, who were both 17 year olds like him. One day, five armored cars from the Libyan army arrived and took him, along with the simmer, singer, Bougagur, and all the other Saad Sheens who were working in the company, of whom there were 40, counting everyone, some with and some without educational qualifications, and enrolled them in the Libyan army at a training center from hell, where they stayed for three months. They graduated at a military ceremony attended by the leader himself. They took the names of the kids who were from his tribe and seconded them to his personal guard at Al Azizia, his permanent headquarters, the place where he uttered his last cry before being murdered. The rest they distributed among the Saad Sheen companies fighting in the Sahara at Al Zu. The leader preferred and trusted the Saad Sheen troops and held to the Libyan troops as examples of fortitude, excellence, dedication, and devotion to soldiering, so as to shame them. While they were being sported through the desert that stretches between Sirt, where the training camp was located, and Sabha, which was the forward position for the fighting in Al Zu, the singer, Awad Bu Abdel Gadal Ameliki, escaped. He escaped and went back to Egypt where his days of glory as an artist began. Saleh was inducted into the leader's guard at El Azizia. He was part of the regular guard who wore military uniforms and berets and were used as decoration, standing with their weapons at the main gate. Some of the Saad Sheen held high rank and were colonels and important commanders, like Colonel Errifi Arumhi, from Ayum by origin, who liberated Al Zu. Saleh, having no education, was an ordinary soldier, but he had the right to open fire on anyone who entered El Azizia without permission from the leader, even if it was the leader's own deputy. It was on this authority that Saleh Bu Habbuna joined the rest of the guard in firing on the officer Hassan Ashkel and killing him. Ashkel was an officer close to the leader, belonged to his tribe, and had previously been a plainclothes policeman in Sabha. When the mighty 1st of September revolution arose, the leader transferred him to the army and him a commander of the forces positioned around his birthplace of Sirt. Nobody knows why he was killed at the gate of Al Azizia. Thank you very much, uh, Hugh, and thank you, Hamdi, also. So we now move on to the second set of readings uh, from Slipping. And I'm going to ask first the author, Muhammad Khair, followed by the translator, Robin Moja, to read the same ex extract in their respective languages on the same uh, basis as we did just now. Thank you. Okay, again, thank you, Ruben. Thank you all. Uh, I, uh, I was uh, congratulating uh, Ruben for his well deserved uh, uh, prize. I will read from chapter two uh, of Flat Lasaba or Slipping. 
المرة لم يهتم بما نفق في السماء كانت السحب تتهادى بحذر كأنما تخشى أن تنسكب وعلى الأرض كنت أجد الخطى خلف بحر محاولا الحق بخطوته السريعة رغم قصر ساقيه قادني عبر شارع صغير لكنه واسع الشرفات في محر به وتوقف أسفل بناية كبيرة صامتة تحتل ناصيتين مكثنا تحتها قليلا حتى بدا على بحر انه تذكر عاد ليمشي حتى وصلنا الى شارع عريض انارته بلطف شمس بدايات الشتاء السكندري هناك حيث وصلنا تساندت البنايات القديمه صفراء متقشره وبعيده على الجانبين وامتدت عبر الارض شبكه هائله من قضبان الترام وقد تداخلت في نفسها كالشرايين تحرك بحر منقلا قدميه بينها وتبعته بحذر كان ينظر إلى الأرض بتركيز كمن يتذكر مع أنه يرى ويعبر قضيبا تلو الآخر فأعبر خلفه وعند نقطة بعينها توقف بحر لثوان ثم همس هنا وجذبني لأقف خلفه بالضبط في اللحظة نفسها انبعث من بعيد صوت الدمدمة المعدنية المميزة لعجلات الترام وأخذ الصوت يرتفع بالتدريج ومن الجهة الأخرى خلفنا انبعثت دمدمة شبيهة كأنها صدى الصوت الأول ومن موقعي خلف بحر حيث يعلو رأسي همته القصيرة رأيت الترام قادما من الجهة اليمنى يتبعه شقيقه قادما من اليسرى كان الترامان يتجهان مباشرة نحونا فبدأت ركبتي ترتجف لا إراديا بحر لم يرد ثم بعد ثوان قال أغمض عينيك إن شئت لم أجرؤ على أن أفعل ولمت نفسي مجددا على قبول تلك المهمة التي يتصاعد جنونها وارتفعت الدمدمة واهتزت الأرض وتطاير الحصي الصغير وأخذ الترامان يقتربان من الجهتين ويزدادان سرعة وددت الهرب لكن بدأ لي أن الوقت قد فات وأنني قد أفقد طريقي وستغابة القضبان على الأرض وقد أجد نفسي على القضيب الخطأ فبقيت محلي وصل الترام الأيمن أولا تجاوزتنا المقدمة العجوز المتهالكة وانحرفت بمقدار بسيط جدا لكنه كان يكفي للعبور بجوارنا كأنه يلامسنا وخيل إلي أنني رأيت قائد الترام ينظر إلينا من مقعده المرتفع بلا أدنى تعبير وعندما وصل الترام الأيسر يسير على قضبانه المتداخلة مع الآخر وينحرف من لينترات فيعبر إلى يسارنا العربات من هنا ومن هنا تعلونا صفراء كأنها ظل للبنايات على الجانبين لو تحركنا مليمترا لدهستنا إحداها كنا في قلب بقعة شبه دائرية بالغة الصغر خلقها توازي الترامين صوت العجلات هائل ونفس الموت حاضر والضوء اختفى خلف سقف الترامين العابرين ثم للحظة بين تقطع الضوء رأيتها كانت تجلس إلى ماكينة الخياطة في ثياب النوم وتنظر إلي متفحصة قبل أن تقول لي بشيء من الدهشة كبرت يا سيف ثم اختفت كانطفاء نجم وبدا كأن الترامين العابرين حولنا لن ي... لن ينتهي أبدا ماذا لو أخطأ بحر؟ ماذا لو أزاحت السمون القضبان عدة مليمترات؟ أو ماذا لو مال أحدهما بفعل العمر أو قلة الصيانة؟ هل يشعر المنتحرون بهذه الأحاسيس في الثواني الأخيرة قبل الدهس؟ هل يرون ما رأيت أم تقتلهم الصدمة العصبية قبل الصدمة الحديدية؟ ورحل الترمان أخيرا تلك الأخيرة لم تستغرق سوى ثوان لكني أخذت أتحسس شعري كأنما لا أعرف إذا ما ازداد الشيب فيه وعلى العكس مني بدأ بحر منتعشا ما زالت نقطة النجاة كما سماها ودونها في أوراقه موجودة هل أنشأتها الصدفة أم صممها مهندس ما عمدا كلعبة سرية ومن اكتشفها هنا وقبل أن أسأله وضع بحر يده على كتفي وأشار برأسه عند نقطة التقاء الترامين حيث توقفنا غمز بعينه وسأل مبتسما ها هل رأيت شيئا؟ صمت مبهوتا لحظة وتبع هو سؤاله وقد اتسعت ابتسامته من رأيت؟ أجبت بصوت كالفحيح أمي تطلع إلي للحظة من دون تعبير ثم هز رأسه ببطء لأعلى وأسفل وقد بدأت نظرته تعكس شيئا من خيبة الأمل فتح شفتيه ليقول شيئا ثم تراجع وأخيرا قال بشفتين ممطوطتين كلاسيك كنت ما زلت مأخوذا فلم أعلق تأملت شعره الأشيب الأنيق 
ونظاره الحمراء الغريبه حيويته التي فسرتها بحياته الطويله في الخارج لم يكن يبدو اطلاقا اطلاقا كشخص سوف يموت بعد اقل من شهر واحد ولم اكن اعلم بذلك انذاك ورغم ذلك فلا استطيع استعاده تلك الذكرى دون ان اخرج موته منها ارانا دائما بين الحلم واليقظه واقفين تحت تلك الشمس اللطيفه في محرم بك بينما اللسان الثقيل يعجز عن تحذيره من موته القريب شكرا لكم شكرا thank you very much uh, robin over to you hello clouds inched across the sky as though afraid they'd spill while down below i strained to keep up with bus bus short-legged but rapid clip Moharam Bay, he led me down a narrow street with wide balconies beneath its windows before coming to a halt outside a huge silent building which ran the length of a block, and there we lingered for a moment. Bahr appeared to be thinking. Then off he sat again, trotting along until we came to a broad avenue, aglow in the pale sunlight of early winter. Alexandria's aging buildings sagged into one another, yellowed and peeling. They were set back from the road on either side, and between them lay a great network of streetcar lines, crossing and recrossing like a tracery of veins. Bach picked a path through the tracks, and cautiously I followed. I followed him over rail after rail, while he kept his gaze fixed on the ground, as though trying to marry a memory to what he saw. Suddenly, he stopped, whispered, here and tugged at me so that I was standing bolt upright directly behind him. Then I heard it, the distant but distinctive metallic tick of streetcar wheels approaching, and as that grew louder, an identical ticking, echoing the first, started to close in from somewhere behind us. From where I stood, looking out over the top of Bach's head, I could see one streetcar coming from our right, and another, its twin, running in from the left. Both were making straight for us, and my knees began to tremble involuntarily. Bah? For a few seconds, he said nothing, then shut your eyes if you want. But I couldn't bring myself to shut my eyes. And once again, I steeled myself to face the gathering madness of the mission ahead. The ticking grew louder, and the ground trembled. Flecks of gravel hopped and flew, and the approaching cars began to pick up speed. I wanted to run, but it was too late. I might lose my way amid the forest of tracks, might end up on the wrong line. I stayed put. First to reach us was the streetcar to the right. Its ancient, dilapidated snout kinked our way ever so slightly, a deviation that brought it almost close enough to brush us as it passed. And I saw, or thought I saw, the driver on his raised stool gazing down at us with absolute impassivity. And then the second arrived, rolling down rails that seemed only slightly set off from the tracks the first had taken, and it kinked too, a few millimeters away from us this time, and went on by, car after car looming over us, yellow as the shadows of the buildings lining the road. If we shifted even a centimeter, we would have been run down, we stood in a roughly circular and impossibly tiny clearing bracketed by the cars. The racket from the wheels was tremendous. Death was breathing very close, and the daylight vanished behind the roof of each passing carriage, then reappeared. And in the flickering light, I saw her, sitting at her sewing machine in a nightgown, squinting at me. She said, you've grown safe. She sounded surprised. Then she disappeared, a star winking out, and it felt as though the passing carriages would never come to an end. What if Bach had miscalculated? What if the rails with their central jutting tooth were to shift just a fraction? What if one, too old perhaps, or poorly maintained, were to buckle or bend? Was this what suicides felt in the last seconds before impact? Did they see what I was seeing, or did shock claim them? before the shock of steel. And then at last, 
the streetcars were gone. An at last that marked the end of no more than a few seconds, but even so I patted at my hair, perhaps to feel whether the patch of rougher grey had spread. But Bach seemed invigorated. The safe point, as he called it, pointing to a page in his notebook, still existed. Was it the product of pure chance, or had some engineer put it there on purpose, as some kind of secret game? And who had first discovered it? Before I could ask, Bach laid his hand on my shoulder and nodded toward the place where we'd been standing, where the two lines parted and rejoined. He gave me a wink and asked, did you see anything safe? Still pale, I stayed silent. So he asked again, his smile widening, who was it? My voice was a whisper, my mother. He stared at me blankly for a second, then nodded slowly. His expression seemed to reflect a trace of disappointment, and he opened his mouth as though to speak before seeming to reconsider. At last, lips thin, he muttered, typical. Still stunned, I didn't reply, just looked at him. The neat gray hair, the odd red glasses, the vigor I attributed to a life spent out of doors, nothing at all like a man who would be gone within a month. Not that I knew that then, though I can't now summon the memory without the fact of his absence surfacing through it. Between dream and waking is where I see us, forever standing beneath that soft sunlight in Muharram Bay, my tongue too heavy to warn him. Thank you very much, Robin, and thank you also, Mohammed, and indeed thank you for all our readers uh, of extracts both in Arabic and in English. So we move on to the final part of this evening, which is uh, an opportunity to have a little bit of discussion and question and answer perhaps. And we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Karis Olshok, uh, who should now have appeared on your screen, who was the chair of judges for uh, this year's panel. Um, I'm sure many people are quite intrigued with what goes, goes on uh, within a panel of judges, and I'm not going to promise that she'll make any great revelations, but it, it would be nice to know. We've, it's a rather surprising result, if you look at it. We've got two joint winners of the prize, which is the only time, only the second time that this has happened over uh, quite a number of years, uh, and only one extra book in the short so just wondering what was it about these two works in particular uh, that um, made the panel of judges single them out well single them out perhaps but um dual them out as uh, the joint winners <laughs> of the prize um well thanks for the question um paul and i'd also just like to um thank bani pal for the huge honor of getting to judge this prize i mean it was a challenge but it was also wonderfully enjoyable as well actually i think um the the joint winners was the easiest part um amidst a lot of discussion a lot of issues just many more than I I could have dreamed of at the start of the process that came up um, between the four of the judges but but these absolutely stood out um, for us both of them um, in terms of the, the boldness with language um, in different ways of course um, and the way that the translations dealt with the kind of the brilliance of the original of each and were rigorously careful with it um, but brought it into striking and gripping literature in English. I mean at first glance the works are very different of course um, I think the language of slipping is more obviously straightforward in terms of of the the literary register of Arabic, and I think that the the kind of the greatness of the translation lies in the vividness of the images, which I think is really clearly demonstrated um, in that extract, which is certainly my favorite of the novel with the streetcar, um, and the kind of um, the way that the English captures moments of intensity in the novel, uh, whether moments of shock like the streetcar, um, or where moments where things are, are kind of revealed or connected, um, sudden moments of uncanny awareness. Um, uh, 
uh, and in staying faithful, of course, to the kind of detached but melancholic but absurd but empathetic tone um, of the original. And then you have the, the sheer massive challenge of the men who swallowed the sun, um, which clearly, very clearly stood out to us who were reading in Arabic, um, uh, sort of combining different registers of the language, many different dialects, as Hamdi Abu Ghalayl has referred to, local aphorisms and puns, um, historical references and jokes, and this kind of supercharged um, double narrator um, uh, that goes to some very dark places. Honestly, couldn't imagine anyone um, other than Humphrey Davies um, who could have done justice to it in the way that this translation does. Um, of course, there are synergies between both as well in terms of the theme of migration to Europe, um, but more importantly in their, their experimentalism, um, the way that they work with the novel form, with character, with panorama, with narrative voice, and with humor and absurdity. Um, they absolutely stood out for us, uh, the novels themselves and their, their translators. Um, well, so congratulations, um, Robin, and, and the authors as well. Thanks very much. You referred at one point when you were speaking to qualities that stood out to those of us that were reading uh, the original language. Um, I wondered, you're chairing a panel of which two members read the Arabic and the English, but the other two members only read the English. Whether you think this creates difficulties or whether everybody's looking for the same thing or how does the dynamics of it work? Or how did they work for you? I'm sure they yeah. don't work the same for everybody. Yeah, I knew this, this was really um, an interesting part of, of the process um, because obviously um, when we're reading in Arabic, we were aware of, of some of the extra challenges involved in some translations. And we are also, um, you know, honing in on accuracy as a sort of, you know, a fundamental of, of a translation to, 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 to sort of not, yeah, um, not make slips, I suppose. Um, and where the, the English readers were, you know, they were looking for a good gripping, um, uh, ambitious work of literature. And I think those two types of reading uh, did, um, yeah, uh, there was some kind of uh, friction between them at points. Um, but I think that that's, that's where we came to make a number of compromises. Um, kind of, it's certainly where, you know, those places where we agreed, that was very clear. Um, and then, um, and then in the other places, how we how we made the compromises was, um, uh, yeah, was was a, a, a very interesting and enlightening process um, for me at least. Well I won't ask you to give too many other <laughs> secrets away, we've given away quite enough already. So uh, just to change tack a bit, before we do that can I just remind the audience that if you've got questions of your own you'd like to put to Robin or Karis, uh, please use the chat facility on the Zoom which should be or at the bottom of most people's screens. Um, Something slightly different before I ask my, uh, Robin a, a, a couple of questions. Both authors, both books published in Egypt. Um, I mean, do you see any significance in this? I mean, the sort of all the standard histories of the development of the of the modern Arabic novel put Egypt right at the centre of things. Um, not so much recently, perhaps, but. Uh, did this sort of the geographical, I'm not sure uh, how this played out in this particular set of entries, uh, but do you think that the geography of um, where people are writing is of any interest at the moment? Are you asking? Paris? Oh, sorry, <laughs> no, you were. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There, yeah, I mean, as I said, I definitely noticed um, synergies um, between, well, but sort of between these two. Um, but I think they, at the same time, they 
they represent very different um, streams of, of modern Egyptian, contemporary Egyptian literature kind of doing, doing different things. Um, there were some, there was um, a couple from, one from Tunisia and one from Morocco that kind of chimed together quite well. They're very much set within universities, um, student movements, um, very satirical. Um, but then there were certain um, kind of genres that, yeah, just moved beyond national boundaries, I think. And um, particularly the historical novels are kind of looking back beyond the time of um, modern nation states in any case. Um, and, and those are quite peripatetic novels um, that, that move around through the cities um, of, of the Middle East. So, oh, it's a, yeah, interesting question um, because the, the variety of work from poetry to sort of more popular fiction to very um, avant-garde fiction was, was quite astonishing. And I think that, you know, as well as the geographic range um, did make the judging process very difficult because you're kind of bringing together very different types of, 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 of literary work. Um, sorry, sort of digressed from your original question there. No, <laughs> That's what questions are for <laughs> at this stage of the evening. Robin, you were about to answer that question. Um, no, I, I wasn't. Would you I like was to hoping, give your I, own I take on it? I wouldn't have to. <laughs> um, Sorry? <laughs> I was just hoping I wouldn't have to. Um, no, I, um, if, I, if I can sort of remember it, uh, remember it accurately of what you were asking about, um, about the significance, of, the significance of the books coming from Egypt. Both coming from Egypt and and of sort of trends in. I suppose the only thing I would add is that there's a difference between what appears in translation. Um, there's that filter, which is probably the most important one. And already, I mean, I've translated Mohammed um, Mohammed more recently, but I've also I, I read um, Sajin the novel for the American University in Cairo for the reader's report for it. And I've translated Hamdi's book al a long time ago now. And these are, you know, they've always been important writers to me. And they might, you know, these two books have appeared now, but both of these authors have been working for a very long time and have had their moment in a prize or have or being translated and it, it's difficult or maybe dangerous sometimes to put significance on it i think people sometimes want yeah. to see I, I would say both of them belong to a sort of um anyway sorry yeah back to back to ramble yeah uh, well let's ask you a more direct question um yeah. uh, uh i mean how was your experience it's a very general question to give you right. an opportunity to speak yeah. Uh, uh, at length or, or otherwise as you wish. I mean, how was your experience of um, translating uh, this novel uh, when Hugh was talking uh, or Catherine in her uh, tribute, I can't remember which, talking about the importance of um, having a dialogue with the author yeah. for example, which is I mean, something which in my experience is very variable um depending on all sorts of different circumstances but how how did things play out with you um in terms of translating this work okay so uh i think maybe just to reframe that question for my own purposes yes, i would say there are two sort of dialogues so i've been reading Mohammed for a long time these short stories mainly actually and so this was the story of how I, when I first read this novel and how we did it. So in, I think that's an important dialogue that you are um, thinking that you like the, right, the reading and you're sort of, in some sense, to put it very kind of basically, you feel you understand the writer or you look forward to their work and you, you're sort of into what they're doing. And I think of that as a kind of dialogue, first and foremost. But me and Mohammed hadn't really been in communication. I translated some of his short stories for a, like a, a little website I had just so I could do things like pretend I was busy 
And when I read this novel, um, it had a lot of themes that I recognized from his short stories, or uh, not themes exactly, that's not the word, but sort of techniques, but talking to Mohammed about it, um, especially we did a sort of correspondent um, that was partly on the suggestion the publisher wanted to put something on the galleys that went out and we had a correspondence between each other. We wrote emails back and forth and then I translated them and they put them on the end of the galleys edition at least. And that was uh, an experience I haven't really done before. It was formal, it was kind of artificial in a way, but it was, it, 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 it was lovely. And it was making concrete and formal something that I think comes through reading and the process of working with an author through actual translate, like through to more, you know, to talk about passages and things like that. Yeah, yeah. that's very interesting. Uh, we're getting some questions from the audience. So here's one really goes to both of you, I think. Um, both works, this is obviously somebody that read both of them, at least I hope it is, uh, both winning works can be considered obviously in general terms avant-garde, I mean it's a very generalised term, but do you think they in any sense represent a, a sort of the direction or one of the main directions in which contemporary Arabic novel is heading? Uh, I noticed in your correspondence with Muhammad the, the terms like magical quality or magic came up you know more than once uh, mm. and both, both works have a sort of sort of flavor i mean obviously they're very different in many ways but there is a sort of flavor of this that seems to pervade the both do you think this is typical or, or are they against the trend in a sort of respect um it, so the, the question is about the, the magic quality or about the, the direction of the Arabic novel, which is both. both. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, both of them are, are very different. And, um, you know, certainly if the variety of, of the, you know, the total number of um, entries is anything to go by, you know, there's so many, so many trends um, in writing at the moment. I think um, um, in terms of the way they work with language as well, um, sort of one more in the modern standard and one more with dialect, obviously that's that's kind of um, different trends as well. In terms of the magic, yeah, I, I actually had the pleasure of reading um, that interaction between um, Robin, Robin and Muhammad, which is really fascinating um, and um, kind of picked up on on this idea of this kind of magic of something structuring and ordering um, events below the surface, um, kind of something intangible, ephemeral, um, esoteric, which, I mean, it certainly informs a lot of my reading of, of Arabic novels um, and my research I've done on them for, you know, I kind of think you can really trace it back decades. Um, so in a sense, that much is, um, is something that continues within it, within the novel, but is, is changing. Uh, and I think that um, Slipping in particular is a really fascinating iteration of that. Um, yeah, which I, I just loved. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I don't know, I mean, it's sometimes difficult if you sort of maybe stubbornly repeat. I almost repeat, I don't like to think about things like that sometimes because I think or I tend to try and resist only as an exercise for myself, some of the patterning that's put onto the development of the novel. And sometimes that's through the desire, that's because, and, and not to sort of play it down, or not to sort of dismiss it, but there's sometimes academic interest in contemporary Arabic literature will access it through, like, you know, there was a passion for talking about utopian and dystopian novels or, or magic realism and stuff like that, which is all valid, you know. Um, and then there's also the commercial aspect of it um, and how people want to sort of package and talk about things, which is also important. But for example, if there's a quality that you can pull out of um, 
for example, Hamdi's been writing the way he writes for a long time. And what's interesting about Hamdi is, is stylistic, apart from anything else, and, and a heavy layer of irony that underlies everything. And the way Muhammad writes, it's extremely, it's extremely, like his short stories, especially if you read them, they have some of the qualities of the novel, but in very concentrated form, very dreamlike and very much more disturbing, actually. Um, and you can kind of call it magic realism. There's, there's some qualities of that, there's some sort of genuinely sort of magic realist qualities in it. But it's more, for me, what's interesting is the style of the writing. And I wouldn't say, you see, you could say maybe, I wouldn't say that avant-garde, or at least how I understand, how I kind of grew up understanding avant-garde literature necessarily, well, that's not this thing to say. Um, they are both novels that are quite ambitious in literary terms. And, mm. and um, it's, well, they're sort of, they're, if you like, which isn't, you know, a sort of value judgment, but they're pro properly literary novels. And there are many other kinds of books that have been written in the Arab world, which is in itself, for me, a slightly problematic thing to talk about, like Arab literature, contemporary Arabic literature, um, because there are national interests, there are national sort of things you can look all of this, I don't, you know, and I, I am one person and I know, you know what I mean? I'm not writing, I, can, I read what I can read and I'm interested, I have my own reading project, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about that sometimes. I think, um, I think novels just as interesting and challenging have been for a very long time, especially in Egypt. I mean, from what I'm interested in was, you know, throughout the eighties and nineties onwards, people were doing this. And when there was a commercial audience, when less people were reading, and when your only audience, uh, Mohammed talked about this a bit, but in the 90s, when your only audience with other people were publishing books, um, that the environment in which experimentation takes place. Some people think it's unhealthy. Some people think it's navel gazing, sometimes with a sort of slight touch of bitterness, but it's that, that's a sort of um, crash, you know, of of these kinds of experiments in writing when you're really doing the sort of six people that are going to read your book. Yeah. Have you got a, a, another project project coming up in, in train at the moment? Me? Yes. I mean, well, I mean, you know, I'm working to live, but I've got um, Im uh, um, Iman Marsal's book on the that's, well that's been done but it's being edited now so um i'll be looking at that in a, in a minute and that's a lovely book if people haven't read it it's really interesting it's about the um this author and the desert who wrote a book one book and killed herself or died and then the book came out four years later and it became a sort of cult classic, or it became either unknown or a cult classic if you knew about it. And it's exploring her life and the afterlife of the book. Um, and it's, a, yeah, so there's that. And yeah, and sort of reading other novels, but also just translating stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, perhaps we could finish with a, a question to each of you, which is not exactly the same for each of you but overlaps um, Robin I mean how do you see the general scene as regards translation of Arabic fiction into English at the moment or publishers becoming more receptive to it uh, um, what's your current experience I mean oh, I don't know that's a really that's a really big question I I, I think translators there's a lot more focus on there's a lot more interest in translators and there's a lot more space for translators to talk about themselves and how they live but at the same time everyone who translates and not especially but definitely in Arabic into English in that sort of sphere people have 
still, it used to be even more idiosyncratic, but still their own paths into how they work and how they've ended up where they are. And I, just by virtue of my, um, what do they call it, by my life ways, I've not really been in the UK, I've not really, for a long time, I've been sort of in and out of contact with a lot of it. So I don't, I don't know. It's definitely, there's definitely more publishers than when I started. But I mean, I published my, my first book that I published in translation was Hamdi's was Zalfair. But I, but since then, yeah, I mean, it's more open, but then some of the, but then some things are sort of, some things maybe are more difficult in a funny way. I don't know. It's a very big, it's a very big question. And obviously I haven't um, got my brain around it. Quickly. Well, <laughs> yeah. not, not the same question, but a similar question to Karis. You are sitting there in a, a distinguished academic environment where for many years, nothing written in Arabic after about um, 1250 or so would have been taken seriously. <laughs> Uh, how do you see the status of um, modern Arabic literature in the academic environment? Um, in terms of, of kind of scholarship on it or teaching of it in the university? Well, both, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, if I just think um, think about about my university, I mean, I'm certainly the only um only lecturer in modern arabic um in the university and obviously if you compare that to um french literature colleagues or something it, it's a little bit demoralizing and you know you feel like you don't necessarily have conversation partners you'd like to have however it is a quite an interesting development that for example in in the english faculty of my university now there are, are actually two two lecturers who have been hired in the last few years who, who are working on Arabic um, in an English faculty. So, you know, the kind of departmental breakdowns can lead to some funny things like that. Um, so, you know, I think bit by bit, um, there are more positions opening up, um, more um, conversations being able to be started in, in my university. It'd be very hard for me to comment more broadly, I think, at the moment um uh i know it's yeah i know it's a difficult job market for most um um and um in terms of scholarship i think it's a really exciting time um uh i get i'm getting to to edit a journal at the moment and the kind of exciting things we have coming in um uh, new ways of reading uh, comparing, theorizing, I, I find really exciting. Also love teaching. I, I find students um, have a great thirst for contemporary Arabic literature, which um, rather surpasses um, that for the pre-modern most of the time. Um, they really, really enjoy reading it. Um, they get a lot out of it. And um, so, so I take a lot of heart from that. Absolutely great. Well, that's an optimistic note to <laughs> end on. Um, Could I just, sorry, Paul, I don't, just before you say a thing, because um, just that there are two judges here of who have um, judged the prize. I'd just like to say thanks very much for all the nice things you said about the book. <laughs> and, that, you know, thanks for choosing it. Um, <laughs> but um, it was really, actually, and just like I'm reading it and listening to you talk now, Obviously, you said very nice things, so that that was great. But also, it was a lovely reading of the book. I really, it was, it was really nice, and it was, uh, it was really interesting. So, thanks very much. There you go. That's, that's great. Well, that's great. It's great to hear you say that. I mean, it's not very often that um, the sort of the winners get a chance to almost interrogate their judges. <laughs> no, but it's not. Yeah, well, I mean, what, what do I have to say in a good choice? It's not, not really an interrogation. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, no, but it's also nice for me because I, I lived for a long time in South Africa and I didn't, I didn't come and, and meet people or see people I didn't, you know, in Cairo or in um, oh. the UK or whatnot. And now I'm here, so it's also nice to it's also nice to see some faces of people who I, I knew yourself, Paul. We've never spoken, and and all of this business. So it's it's nice, yeah. Well, 
Anyway, that's a Thank you very much. Perhaps I'll just, I'll just add something to what Karis said about the uh, about the final choices of, and you know weighing up the, uh, the preferences of the English speaking judges and the the bilingual judges. Yeah, yeah. Um, there were compromises and we had some tussles, didn't we, Karis? But I don't think there were any compromises over the winners. I think the winners no, no, absolutely not. That was a straightforward bit. <laughs> the criteria of you know both accuracy and fidelity and whatnot and you know excellent literary style and and plot and all of those things so Great. congratulations well it all seems to have been a wonderfully harmonious process <laughs> <laughs> one Long. of the best jobs to do honestly just oh, you know right. get a big so, box of books and um yeah it was it was lovely you're volunteering again, are you? Next year? <laughs> Not next year, but the year. <laughs> careful, careful. on a future occasion. Yeah. Anyway, well, that's great. It's nice um, to see you all. Um, uh, before I say thank yous, as it were, I should also just remind people that an edited version of this session, we hope to be available on the Banipal and the Arts Canteen websites within a few days after a bit of tidying up has been done on it. So you have an opportunity to see it again uh, if you want to. Uh, so drawing the session to a close, it's been a, a delightful, I think, very valuable uh, hour or so um, spent. Uh, thanks, um, obviously, first of all, to our friends at Arts Canteen for actually enabling us to put it on. Uh, and for making the technical aspects go so smoothly. Uh, to the Society of Authors, who of course gave the prizes out um, actually last night, but who administer the prize. Um, our sponsor, the Robash family, without whom there will be no prize at all. To this year's judges, two of whom we've seen on uh, screen. Um, to the publishers of the books, I mean, we of the two books concerned, both in the original Arabic and in the translation, publishers often get overlooked in this context. Uh, to everybody who's taken part tonight, uh, the readers, Catherine for the tribute, uh, and uh, Robin and uh, Karis for the discussion, and finally to all of you who have been watching, and I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you very much.